Okay, people, I finally have the theme pick. We can get going on this episode of music. Wait, 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 wait. I am having some deja vu. Oh, yeah. That's a classic. We're just trapped in a stable April Fool's time loop and can't get out until we speak our true feelings on the themes for last episode. Oh, we could stay in the time loop and maybe talk anime. No, 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 no. I hate time loops and we are breaking out of this one. Let's talk dreamy purple cutocious glass. And that is not a request. This is Music Arcade. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Music Arcade. I'm Galen, the sound guy, Firestone. I'm Rana, the round from Normal Stone. And I'm Maddie, and I am having a sense of deja vu again. Oh, we're just in a stable time. I mean, what? Uh, oh, yeah, my name is Sam. Sam Ziegelman. Also called Thoreau. Welcome back. Um, so, last week we talked about everyone else's picks for April Fool's. But we got an idea in our head to talk about what we actually would have picked under these circumstances with these actual topics. And these are our actual picks. There aren't any joke picks in here. There's one that I think might be a joke, but it's a joke that I got the joke of immediately. So we'll talk about that yeah, later exactly. as well. We can be a little cheeky. like We, we can be a little would. cheeky. And if anyone's going to be cheeky, it's, you know, you. But we're not talking about that one yet. We're going to actually start right where we started why, last why time. Why spoil that? We could have made it into a guessing game. No, no, he... I knew. Yeah. In my heart of heart, I knew. Yeah. <laughs> I know what I've done. Yeah. <laughs> let's not bother hiding it. That's for actual April Fools. For this one, let's talk about Dreamy for real. And um, we're going to start with, uh... Well, it's right there in the title now, isn't it? Kind of. Dreams of Flight. Or Sogno di Volare. The main theme for the Civilization 6 uh, tail screen. And uh, I would like to point out, as a bit of an introduction, that the theme which I picked was dreamy and not dream. And just like there is a distinction between a cream and something creamy, but these are closed notions but they're not quite the same, there is a distinction here. And as a result, I picked that song with this in mind, because it has an aspirational quality to it. It is the dream of flight in uh, something you want to attain. And the song, rather than just lulling you into uh, a sort of sleep or lullaby, it grows and grows over its course, it swells up, because of a dream, instead of fading the moment you wake up, it gets closer, it gets more attainable. There's not an end, uh, a sudden alarm clock. The end is when you're witching upon high. I first considered something more personable in its dreaminess, think Gaston song in Beauty and the Beast, but... Hmm. Uh, uh, I checked on this track, which is very good, very uh, solid orchestra, basically a track that had the difficult task to live up to Baba Yetu from Civilization 4, and in my opinion, kind of managed it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, Christopher Tin. we hadn't Tim. talked about it. Yeah, it, it's Christopher Tin. This is the sort of thing we expect from him. It's big, yeah. it's sweeping, it's multicultural. He has a... He has a system and it works. He has a style and it works. Exactly. The lyrics may be in Italian, but the dream of flight is more or less universal, which works for a game as wide rich enough as this one. Honestly, Even I, though I think since it... the latest part of the little pack, I can't play it with the expansions anymore for some weird buggy reason. What? Uh, I think... Going back to the, the actual song, I think it's interesting that you brought up the lyrics. Because uh, I couldn't find actual confirmation from Christopher Tin on on the origin of the lyrics. But the accepted theory among fans seems to be that he was inspired by writings from Leonardo da Vinci on uh, dreaming about flying. Uh, oh yeah, I think I heard something similar, but I don't remember what. Yeah, I, I cannot find actual sources for it, but uh, yeah. the actual quote, I have it uh, translated to English, 
is uh and the problem is that uh is civilization 6 did a great job at uh, communicating with dev interviews all throughout the game's uh, development cycle expansions included meaning that Finding one individual interview is kind of hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that doesn't help. But yeah, like uh, the the actual quote and on on the on the video with the accompanying playlist for the episode, you guys can uh, see a visualizer with the lyrics in uh, Italian and their translated version in English, and compare for yourselves. But the quote uh, attributed to Leonardo da Vinci is, "When once you have tasted tasted light." You will never, for, you will forever walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward, for there you have been, and there you will always long to return. And it, it's not a one-to-one -one with the actual lyrics of the song, but it's Good very arrive. close. That yeah, that's uh, uh, a dream that was as of the inspiration unattained, and that since then has been and. I think looking back on that is kind of civilization in a nutshell. Pretty much. And the song it really does capture that feeling of dreaming, of flying and having the wind rushing by you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. But that's not the only track we're going to talk about in this category about Italian dreams. <laughs> <laughs> We turned out to have a, a bit of a, a sub-theme of Italian stuff that will come back later. But uh, for now, Assassin's Creed 2, uh, Dreams of Venice, which is another one where it's in the title. But uh, I, I think this one conjures, at least to me personally, more of a, a vibe of dreaming of being able to experience big moments in history, which plays to what Assassin's Creed is about. Mm-hmm. And uh, while this game is in the Renaissance, I specifically imagine, uh, picture in my mind when I listen to this stuff like seeing the Colossus of Rhodes, the uh, Library of Alexandria, great lost uh, marble um, sculptures from ancient Rome, stuff that has actually been lost to time, being able to experience that again. Uh, that is the sort of dream that comes to my mind when I hear this. It, it sounds very grandiose, as if you're dreaming of seeing these grandiose structures of the past in person. That makes sense, because I thought, for how bustling Venice is, that this feels oddly solemn. Yeah. Yeah, they have a few songs for each uh, city in the game. I, I can't remember where this, this one plays. I think it's more around the canals specifically and not really yeah, open areas. Which makes sense because with the background of bassy strings and harps, that contributes to really adding the aquatic ambience of it all. I think it's also possible. I, I could be misremembering. I haven't played Assassin's Creed 2 in a while, but I think it's also possible that it has different tracks that play during daytime versus nighttime. So maybe this is a nighttime track. I again, I kind of speak ball here. It's been a while. My main question, though, is what's happening at two x in this iteration of the song, because it's got a vibe. It follows it for two minutes. It has like this sudden drop and change of tone for ten seconds, and then we get back on the vibe. I have no idea. If I... I were to guess, that's probably just them mixing different songs from the soundtrack into a singular yeah, thing. Yeah, I have... In the context a... of a dream, maybe that's the desynchronization? Possible. I have an assumption about this that is entirely out of story here, but... um. So, you in the on. Tales of Legendia soundtrack by Goshi Ina, you will notice that when you listen to the soundtrack um, compared to what's played in game, uh, the songs are combined. So you have one track that represents like three or four different tracks that are in the actual game that gets cut up and looped in different ways. It's entirely possible that something similar happened here. The composer wrote X amount of songs and they needed Y amount of songs for 
the game itself, so they cut this song up into parts, so they weren't paying for more minutes while still getting more music out of it. I see. I know Blizzard Entertainment does something like that as well. Uh, their World of Warcraft soundtrack, each uh, song except for the main title, is usually four or five different songs stuck into a single track on the album. Yeah, so this might I have believe... been uh, just this and... a sort of motif that they had yeah. in the middle there because there was no I... one nowhere else. To and put not it. to bring up. Uh old topics, but uh, Final Fantasy with Endwalker did the same kind of thing with its track during the expansion. I find open world games do that a lot if they're yeah. not uh, like GTA mm -hmm. where you have radios, because you need yeah, a but, lot of but... variation on the sound and that's too much to fit a single album. Yeah, and yeah. that kind of uh, calls back to uh, a fair amount of time ago, because I believe uh, orchestral arrangement of the Actraiser soundtrack does the same thing. With yeah, multiple it's... tracks per track. It's but not the an transition uncommon... is certainly more subtle there. That's fair. Well, I, I, again, going back to Legendia in particular, it's two of my favorite dungeon themes duct taped together with a tension theme in the middle is the actual song but in the context of the song itself it's clearly one composition that they just sliced up it's a not uncommon thing to do when it comes yeah, to exactly. production uh, having played the game i think uh, my best guess here is that they might be trying to capture the experience of exploring venice uh, regularly only to suddenly uh, find yourself uh, facing one of the borgia towers actually i i, I can't remember if they're called Borgia Towers in this game or in the sequel. But anyway, there, there are towers that the enemies are controlling and the music tends to get a bit more ominous when you get near them. So my best guess is that they're trying to copy that vibe of you're just exploring Venice and then suddenly enemies. And then you get <laughs> away from them and suddenly no more enemies. That might be what, what they're going for. I, I can't tell. But yeah, I, I agree that that little bit kind of sticks out uh, like a sore thumb. Uh, if it wasn't for that little bit, this song would definitely be in my uh, Sleeping Pills playlist on Spotify. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. everything else is just very... It is grandiose, like I said, but not grandiose in a bombastic way. It, it's very calm, and very soothing as well. Yeah, that's why I thought of the word solemn. It mm -hmm. got... Uh that's uh, important to kind of like it's paying respects to history uh, a, a history that we'll never experience ourselves but we'll get a, something close to it through the game uh, I, again that's my interpretation I could be entirely wrong who, who knows what Jesper Kuda was thinking about when, when composing <laughs> speaking of Stalin uh I decided to bring for my response to the theme Aethervox from Drakengard 3. I like this one. Now, I really like this one. It is a quiet, drummed piece that makes you feel like you're in a state of breathing deep as you're falling to sleep. And walking in fields, your own dreamscape. Yeah, I thought this was very, very pleasant. Uh, I think while the the previous two tracks we talked about were specifically a dream about this, a dream about that, this song to me felt more like a song to dream to. You're dreaming as you uh, listen to this. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to put it. Um, and with the context of the game, it's a dream that you. I desperately don't want to wake up from. Yeah, that's one of the that. few, like, chill moments in that game, because that game is a desperately unchill experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, for my notes, uh, the language does help convey this ethereal quality to the song, but that's not a thing that's just for this one, so I'm not sure I should even count it. No, Tarayoko's I mean, been using the Chaos language yeah. since Dragon Guard 1. That's not... Exactly. But, 
But this was a very like strong example of why it used. Yeah. yeah. But uh, the way it shows something that nice, calm, but very distinct, very clear, uh, it feels less like being asleep or dreaming and more like uh, being very aware to me, like uh, sitting around that campfire. It feels more like this kind of rest, rather than just uh, dreaming or even aspiring to something which was the initial dream, but details. It is a daydream of what could be and what actually is. Fair enough. That said, it's also used during a meeting with a very important character that changes the entire context of the game. So there is also that underlying what could happen next feel to it that I that I like a lot. Yeah, I'll also, just note that uh, b before our guest takes the bullet for maybe misunderstanding the theme, I have been the guy who, in a previous episode where we had summer themes, all of my picks were tropical themes specifically. <laughs> so <laughs> I I'll I'll take the bullet for that one. I don't think I'm that a I'm a stickler for world. I don't think that. I feel like I'm misunderstanding the theme. No, that's that. Uh, I'm no, I'm on board. No, with no, it. it's, it's got like a me thing. Yeah, it's it got a flow of consciousness it, thing going on. I, I understand yeah, it this. Does, different from uh, Rana's initial uh, pr uh, proposition, but still fits the theme. It's not not wrong. Um, mine, on the other hand, may actually be wrong, but I still like it. Um, so I picked Luxendark Lullaby a remix of Serpent Eating the Ground from Bravely Default 1. Okay, so there's a whole backstory here. Um, once upon a time, a major contributor to Overclocked Remix had a kid, and they collaborated with the community to make a lullaby album of video game remixes for the kid to grow up with. It's a much better project than it sounds. This song is kind mm. of the crown jewel for me, because of all the things to remix, Serpent Eating the Ground is this big, loud, frenetic, in-your-face track. Revo does not mess around on this one. Um, and somehow the arranger, a guy by the name of Heaven Wraith, um, makes it chill and quiet and something to fall asleep to, and um, this should not work. But... Oh, but it does. It does. It really does. And I think one of the ways it works is that is that uh, is very much in line with uh, with dreams because mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a way for somebody to process past event, and uh, this kind of feels like that. This feels like uh, looking at something that was intense in the past and kind of rearranging, taking some of the elements completely removed from its original context and uh, process it through the lens of a sleeping mind. Yeah, and um, I think it lands and connects way better than it has any right to. Like, this is not a song that you think would ever work in this context, especially not with this, like, stripped-down instrumentation. I'd say the, the electric guitar took me a little bit by surprise. <laughs> I don't know how you could do this song without guitars. I, I just don't understand how that's possible. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the original, so I can't tell. But uh, uh, in this version, it definitely took me by surprise. Um, I did post very, the very original in the Music Arcade uh, in the Music Arcade channel, so if you want to actually listen, listen to, to it. I've the original a fair few times. Yeah. Remember it well. So I can understand uh, where you're coming from with how much this just shifts it. It does. Um, but it's got that, like, quiet, chill, dreamy, as Rana said, like, looking back on the past but not nearly as tense or insane uh, sound to it that I think really, like, it was my first and easiest pick for this entire, like, for this category. I'm like, well, this is the yeah. song I'm picking. It's just obvious to me, so... Absolutely. Yeah, my my interpretation so... on of it when I first first listened was sort of a a dream of a more fantastical and uh, whimsical of sorts life. Mm -hmm. 
that's sort of what I got from it. It definitely fits like the soundtrack to a dream, let's say. Speaking of electric cars. Uh, I want first to conclude with one important finding we have about Dreamy. Hmm. Is that there are only two ways to be Dreamy. Either Italian or wrong. <laughs> Good, let, <laughs> glad we cleared that up. Who knew Italians could dream so well? Ah, that's so dreamy. Okay, on the subject of wrong, Randall. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about eternity. Let's talk about purple. Let's yes. Let's talk about Ian Gillen. So, of course, for the theme purple, I took a track from a game named Blue Dragon. Even though last time the joke was that I had the blue as a track. This was not intentional, but it is very funny. Yes, it is funny. Also, uh, on, uh, among other bands, we'll talk about the main one, but the singer on this song, Ian Gillen, did also sing for a different color-related band than the one he's most famous for. He was briefly a singer of Black Sabbath. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. On the Turns other hand, he's to... most known for the band Deep, Deep Purple. Purple. <laughs> yeah. God. Which is very much the intention. <laughs> Yeah. I, um, the I, I reason was, why I picked it. I it's, was listening to our our <sighs> playlist. I reached this song and I went, "Yep, I I, I got it. I mm -hmm. know I know why he went for this one." <laughs> yep, same. I I I face palmed mm -hmm. hard because I'm like, this feels like cheating, but it's totally a valid choice. But yeah, <laughs> you think you see purple as a theme? That's wrong things to pick when deep purple. Yeah, no, that's right. You you got a you got a composition by Ian Gillen and Nobuo Uematsu on here. The combination yeah, and lyrics by Hironobu Sakaguchi. Yeah. For our Xbox 360 RPG uh -huh. with designs by Akira Toriyama uh -huh. that, did, that uh, weren't for dra another Dragon Crest. Even Kira though Toriyama it is a quest with making... a dragon in it. Akira uh -huh. uh, Toriyama loves making his dragon based IPs. It does. Yes. He does. And also, I have never played it. In I... fact, I have only heard of the game like I have a couple played of it. months ago. I have played it. It hasn't aged well. I see. Um, I, I would say but, out of the 360 RPGs from Mistwalker, the former OG Final Fantasy staff, I highly recommend Lost Odyssey. This one doesn't hold up. Yes. Yeah, I feel like this one is less is uh, definitely less uh, uh, remembered the, the way yeah. Lost Odyssey is. And uh, probably for good, for good reason. Yeah. If you believe. And I trust your judgment in a lot of things. Thank you. Uh, but as for the song itself, honestly, even beyond the <laughs> deep purple theme, uh, it's just so fun. It's a fun it's, song. Yeah, it's energetic. It doesn't give an F about anything. It's just. It's certainly rough around the edges. Yeah. Like some of the uh, way it's sung is like... It's almost feeling like uh, a karaoke song you're singing very drunk, very late at night. Yeah. And it I doesn't love that. Help that. Yeah, it doesn't help that Ian Gillen actually sounds really old on this track. Like, he sounds tired. He's trying, yeah. he's pushing. But the energy is like clearly very forced. Very much. Mm -hmm. Like... This feels like Uematsu being basically using that soundtrack to be able to work with somebody he wants to work no matter why. Yeah, I, I get that impression <laughs> off of this song. Um, also, in case you forgot who wrote it, there's a giant organ solo in the middle because, of course, it's Uematsu. <laughs> of course. Yes. <laughs> he does. Uh, Honestly, uh, like, so. even, even with the organ solo, it reminds me a lot of... Uh an era of Deep Purple where they did experiment a lot of, with the uh, prog rock sounds. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it, it lacks a bit of the energy Deep Purple had during that era, but beyond that, it's very similar, and I love that era of Deep Purple, so this song is pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, for yeah, me, yeah. it's weird. Just I have actually... fun with it and go, wow! Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually like this song as much as I did when I first played the game. I don't know if I was just in a bad mood when I listened to the playlist or something, but I'm like, this used to be awesome, but now it's kind of not doing anything for me. I don't know why that is. Yeah. 
That's gonna happen sometimes. It's gonna happen sometimes. Yeah, I mean... Sometimes it's just that you listen to a song enough and uh, you kind of have processed it. Yeah. That's part of why in my long 300 generic playlist of songs I like, I most of the time listen to the last 20% of it. Um, it's not that they're better than the previous ones, it's just recency bias, I suppose. Yeah, that's fair. New shiny things. Mm -hmm. Indeed. But sometimes, the shiniest things are in the old new of the future past. What now? Uh, time travel spot. That's a transition <laughs> for the blood dragon. Film. I was gonna just be like, here's one dragon to another dragon. Yeah, fair too. Yeah, I, I I was I was trying to do the the mental math here. But yeah, <laughs> I, if I recall correctly, the a Far Cry Three Blood Dragon, the the marketing tagline was the years is two thousand seven. This is the future. I mean, that's and literally think, what's on the thumbnail the game for, the, in for the YouTube video you sent yep. us. So yes, um, I, this is the one and only Far Cry game I've actually played. This is the best Far Cry game as far as I'm concerned. I'm... I don't know about anything about Far Cry at all. <laughs> uh, well, it was 80 synthwave before Stranger Things made it cool again. Fair Pretty enough. Much. And only 10 months after Hotline Miami. Oh, wow. That is timing, yes, I isn't checked. it? <laughs> okay, okay. Funny how it always comes back around to Hotline Miami these days. Um... Yeah, I mean, for, for <laughs> this <laughs> thing, it feels legitimate yeah to look at it yeah, yeah. this is the uh the indie games podcast sometimes i mean hey, it was dude, literally that we talked about hotline games. miami um i don't have much to add to this song this was eddie's pick i'm just going to say that it's 80 synthwave done right and it doesn't feel like it's riding a trend like a lot of 80 synthwave is these days especially after Stranger Things, so it's got a freshness to it, which is kind of weird considering how, like, aggressively retro it is. I think it helps okay. that instead of trying to shoehorn one of their in-house composers into doing uh, Synthwave, they mm -hmm. actually uh, grab the... I'm not sure if it's a band or, or a single artist, but they go by Power Glove, and their entire thing is they do retro rave uh, sounding music. I mean, with the name, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, right, exactly. so that that definitely helps make uh the soundtrack feel more cohesive, and not trend chasing. Mm -hmm. and yeah, and uh, one thing I note compared to a lot of tracks in that genre is that it specifically goes for kind of a sub vibe, which absolutely one hundred percent fit the vibe of this thing because it sounds not just like generic dreamed up idea of the eighties, but like an eighties action movie. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, is very much the vibe it of the game itself, so it fits. Well. Yeah, we've, on top of that, because of the retro future vibe, some electro that almost have a little feel of Jean Michel Jarre in there. Feel and, of what? Uh, what now? <laughs> a, a little feel like some of the tracks from Jean Michel Jarre. I get it. I get it. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I don't know what. I... Yeah, Jean-Michel Jarre is a French uh, electronic artist. Uh, I, you might be... Correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe you're thinking of the Rendezvous album? Uh, I... No, I... I mean, when I think of Jarre, because I'm a horrendous normie, I think of Oxygen. Mm. I grew up with uh, uh, Rendezvous because it's... Um, my mom and I, we've always been into astronomy, and that album was uh, uh, meant to have a sax solo by a, uh, a, an astronaut from the Challenger mission, so it ended up being a tribute to uh, to the victims of Challenger. But it has some oh, synth sounds very similar to, to uh, yeah. some parts of this song as well. I mean, no reason to throw away all of his instruments from one album to the next. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I kind of got that as well. Weirdly enough, it's nice Dude. of you to bring it up. Hey. So I'm a normie, but I at least know what the ne next series 
<laughs> that we're talking about. Uh, Shin Megami so Tensei. Right so this one comes from the... I, I don't remember if it was DS or 3DS, but it was Shin Megami Tensei 4. 3DS. It was 3DS, okay. Uh, my eyes can't handle the 3D, so I always played it on 2D, so I don't actually have much 3D knowledge for you on that, that one. That's the, that's the thing. None of us use the 3D function. I used it for Fire Emblem and uh, A Link Between Worlds. Because I, on top down, it looks pretty nice. I think I did use it on Link Between Worlds as well. Um, no question. Do you wear glasses? No. Okay. Somehow you survived that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's. I, I was going to say there's your problem, but, but uh, I think a better way of phrasing it is that there's our problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, God. Anyway, uh, so yeah, I picked the creatively named Battle C1 from Shin Megami Tensei 4. Remember video game music had titles? Nah. No. Nah. You must have imagined it. I must have imagined must have it. Imagined. Um, anyway, so this plays during the VR battles, which I think was like a quasi-DLC. Uh, I think it may have been like DLC Sounds in Japan, like it. but yeah, it, it may have been DLC in Japan, uh, but it came, uh, but it was bundled with the actual game for the global no, release. I think the thing is that it was part of SMT4 Apocalypse, which was kind of an expanded re-release. No, no, SMT4 mm -hmm. was a flat-out sequel, and that came out a couple years after this. Hmm. All right. Carry on. Yeah. Um. Anyway, this song comes to us from Toshiki Konishi, one of the primary composers of Persona 2. Um, a soundtrack that I will defend the grave. But I thought Persona started at free. <sighs> <laughs> oh boy. <sighs> this hurts me as much as it hurts you. Baby. I know it does, that's the worst part. <laughs> uh, um... Anyway, yeah, this song is very tightly controlled. The only reason I associate it with purple is the background of these VR battles is actually purple. Oh, I see. Um, so it's I very on the nose. Yeah. But every time you fight in, with this song playing, it's on a purple background. So, like, straight up reference. It was either this or twice stricken from FF14. And I'm like, we've heard enough about FF14 lately. Um... Yeah, for that track in particular, I really like the synths on the front row that uh, act kind of like a choir. Yeah. And uh, that works for the techno mysticism atmosphere of a SMT like this one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what's funny is this is one of my first two picks that somehow directly references Ali Hillis. And we'll talk about the next one later. Um, Ali Hill is playing your main computer buddy in that game, Burroughs. Um, Wonderful voice for that. Oh yeah, she's, she's great for that. Um, but yeah, uh, this was, uh, yeah, this song just, just works. It's, it's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of layers. It's very in your face, but it's not. It never feels like it's going out of control. It never feels like it's too wild. It's very precise. Yeah. And I think that's a very hard line to straddle. And I think they kind of nailed it. Mm -hmm. Feels like it, has, it knows where its lines are. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's co like coloring that full space within the lines in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. Fully agree there. Um, so while the song itself... Only makes me think of Purple by Association. I, I do like the song, and I always want to give a shout-out to the Persona 2 soundtrack, even in an oblique way. Fair enough. I don't really have anything to add. It's just a really cool battle theme to yeah. listen to. Then let's look to another creatively named title, because they tend to only name their track when they release the full OST. Yep. So... Scaramouche's battle theme, the second phase part of it. From Genshin, Genshin Impact. Impact. Yeah. Yep. Danger, lightning, feelings of anguish, anger, and pain. All of those culminate into a theme that perfectly encap encapsulates ascending, an ascending godly being bent on the world's destruction. We were talking about Twice Stricken, but we're now also talking about another lightning god. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, no, I, I, that's one of the reasons I'm glad I didn't pick, uh, Twice Stricken, because we've been covering quite a bit of the same, uh, context. Purple, lightning, <laughs> and deity level enemy. Yeah, so... Uh, a lightning god that does have mastery of a move on just one element as a little detail. Oh but... yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, but... One of the things that adds to it, when I was talk thinking about, like, the feelings and, like, what I associate with the colors and stuff, anguish, usually blues, anger, reds, that, like, we, we were talking about, like, mixing colors last week, l l not last week, last time, but it makes Which sense. Which was last week, actually, for once? Fair <laughs> enough. Um, <laughs> uh, but mixing those colors in, like, combining that into the pain of what Scaramouche is in the game. Like, between that, like, normally associating purple with darker themes and evils and all of that, then all of those feelings, ah, so good. Mm -hmm. uh, so in my notes, I have that uh, important part, of course, that it's a reprise at first of the Fatui theme, which mm -hmm. is the organization he still belonged to at the time, kinda. Uh, I mean, Dottori works worked on him, so it counts, even though it was... It, basically, he left the Fatui as much as Kiryu left the Tojo clan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you just had to throw that, the one Yakuza reference in there just to mess with us, huh? Save that for a year of the dragon. <laughs> uh, then we have some uh, Electro Sounds, which is atypical for the game. It doesn't really think, tends to add those, but given that you're using a drone to fight a giant mech piloted by a smaller, angrier deified automaton, it just makes sense. And uh, there's the way it goes from one musical phrase to the other is a kind of like him lashing out because he is, on in his godly version, a newborn, which is referred by a small cute story detail. Mm -hmm. Canonically, you lose that fight 168 times, but those happen in a shared simulation of sort, a samsara, that uh, lets you in story prepare for what's happening and anticipate the movement. 168 is also the amount of materials needed to awaken a character from level 1 to level 90, which is implying that you're essentially fighting the boss when he's at level 1, and you're very much not anymore. <laughs> okay, that's actually a pretty cool uh, little detail in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's very cute. You pick up on a lot of things when you join uh, a lore-related uh, Discord channel, as it turns out. Oh, um, we're gonna have some more a... talk later on in this episode as well. You wait for it. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, well, yeah, I, I mean, I have what I have during glass. I'm ready for that. I have a lot more ready for that. <laughs> um, whereas my one comment about this is that the intro of this song kind of reminds me of a boss theme from Final Fantasy XIII too. Uh, specifically the Iron Giant boss theme, which I believe is one of the few songs on that particular soundtrack that was um. Masashi Yamauzu, as opposed to one of the other composers that composed on that one. Um, I don't know, the intro to that just sounded very familiar in that regard, and it's kind of a similar boss battle in that case. It's this kind of loud automaton type thing. Yeah, I find it interesting uh... that uh, despite the electronic stuff, because of, of it being uh, an automaton, it still sounds fairly regal in a way. Yeah, which which was how I associated it with the uh, theme of purple personally. Uh, yeah, that's kind of that due to his deification, the fact that he comes originally from Inazuma, the nation of el the electro elements, which is purple. The fact that it is a giant purple mech, and that in some story bits it even references another, and probably the most famous giant purple make of all, the EVA-01. <laughs> so yes, very Sounds purple. Right. Now then, given that uh, we have went through a lot of purple, let's move on to the next part about things that are cute yet ferocious. 
I have questions I gave... about Hilt in the cannibals attack. I... Well, that's because <laughs> the cannibal fairies. I can uh -huh. actually answer this one. I've played Pit People, and that art style is very cute as well. It's it's yeah. like to, cute to grotesque, give you an but idea, it's cute. To give you an idea, if tactical RPGs in general are chess, Pit People is drunken speed chess boxing. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. And that is both in gameplay and in story. And I can't say I remember all of the details of it, like, you start with your home and all you love crushed by the narrator's angry meteors and three missions later, you chase in a giant bear in a space shuttle, I'm pretty sure. As you do. S Regular exactly. Tuesday for me. So, I'm not certain of the detail, but I do believe that this song, The Cannibal's Attack, plays when you're fighting flesh eating tiny fairies, which explains the buzzing song, the playful in a wrong vocals in contrast with the big drums and animal sounds it's kind of chaos but uh, uh, in it there is definitely the contrast between something cutesy but that will eat you alive both traits exaggerated to a comical degree I did note down that this is fairly out there for our general uh, usual picks but it, it's not unenjoyable uh, you do need to be prepared for a, a, a bit of a chaotic uh, experience, though. Definitely. Like, uh, it has a vibe, and that's not exactly a common one. Yeah. The, the vibe includes mm -hmm. screams in the background. <laughs> um, you know, cute. I, I love how exactly. creative this is, honestly. I, I've got to be honest about that. Uh, it is. The vocals are so cheesy. I, I, I kind of wish more of the percussion was a cappella. I would have loved it if this was a fully a cappella song, but unfortunately it sounds oh, yeah, like... yeah, definitely. It sounds like just two of the drum tracks are, in fact, actual, like, drum pads, and I'm just like... Yeah, no, it's not fully a cappella, but it yeah. would have worked as, as one track. Oh, like yeah, that. it's so I close agree. to it, too. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it isn't mainly as a way to kind of move out with the rest of the soundtrack because it's kind of out where but slightly less than that and uh, it has a mix of instrumentals and vocals mm -hmm. so continuity no i i absolutely agree this song this song does click i i got what you were going for immediately with this topic i, I transmission received yeah like we were talking about Dragon Guard 3 before. It, it kind of fits the tonality in that kind of game, in particular with mm -hmm. the Fairy King that is just this little cutesy light with the most foul-tongued, annoying speech all the time, just getting on your nerves until Squitch it goes. Mm-hmm. Now then, let's move on to another chaotic thing, according to its title in particular, Yamadol Chaos. I, I told you the, the Italian would come back. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's uh, Italian for Flame of Chaos, uh, from Deedlit in Wonder Labyrinth. I can't believe it's not Castlevania. Pretty much. <laughs> uh, like, it, it's, it's a Metroidvania game that uh, it has relatively cute looking graphics but it doesn't undersell the ferocity of no. the characters despite being somewhat cute looking which i think is a, is a perfect summation of of the theme of cute but ferocious mm -hmm. and the, the thing with the soundtrack i i definitely wanted something from this soundtrack because of that that uh, idea but the soundtrack generally either goes straight for cute or straight for ferocious except for this song i feel i feel yeah. like this song is exactly in the middle despite despite being called flame of chaos <laughs> well you say that but i think it's because of the chaotic aspect that it allows itself to move from one instrument one instrumentation to the next and to the next and to the next and kind of go through different themes you know what that's fair if even though it 
does all that through the cohesive lens of uh, the early Metroidvania level song, if you will. Yeah, it definitely like, it has me a, a bit. pace sim similar to uh, Dracula's Castle, for instance. Mm -hmm. It reminded me quite a bit of um, Dracula's Castle in the how it's paced. And some of the darker sounding uh, moments reminded me of the catacombs from Symphony of the Night. So it, it it's definitely wearing its uh, inspiration on its sleeve. Exactly. I mean, the work cycle says it all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but Diglett is just female Alucard, basically. Yeah. Um. And. As somebody that enjoyed the uh, records of the Lord of War, the anime, in, like, the 90s, I'm okay with that. Which I... of the two, the OVA or the TV show? The OVA. I've watched both. I've never... I think I've seen one episode of the series, maybe, in high school. Um, I, th I thought you hated anime, Gail. <laughs> I do. But I still got stuck watching some of it in high school and after and in As general. One does. Like I, I hate it because I have seen it. And I've come to that conclusion after having seen it. I don't hate it in a vacuum. There. I just it's wanted to just... joke I just wanted to joke around a little bit. It's a translation of uh D and D campaign. Yeah. It doesn't even try to hide it. No. Yeah, like mm -hmm. they, they made um, a D and D campaign and turned that into a uh light novel and then turned that into an anime. And, and then turned, turned that, that into that a franchise. Into a game. <laughs> um yeah, I think the game is meant to be a sequel because one of the main characters is dead. Yes, <laughs> uh it was actually I remember reading about this, it was actually written by the story was actually written by the original writer. Um, on a request from this development team, uh, Ladybug. And, uh, yeah, so it is a sequel to those events. Uh, yeah. I did play this one. I, I didn't watch much of the anything. I'm very little familiar with it, but I would I would make the argument that Cute But Ferocious also ascribes directly to the main character herself, because um, she is a good-looking girl, but she will absolutely destroy everything. Especially this version of of Diddlet, because this is a Diddlet that seems to be hundreds of years old. Yeah, She's definitely experienced in battle. Oh yeah, I don't know how she was in the show at all. I don't remember. I barely remember the one episode that I saw. I remember like still images <laughs> in my head, but like I remember how she plays in this game, and she is no joke. She will absolutely mess somebody up. Let me put it this way: in the show, she was the second most ferocious female character and uh, there were many female characters. So it doesn't say much at all. <laughs> uh, so speaking of cute girls that can kick your ass, uh, to quote a person in the comments of the video of Champion Iris's battle music, at least Cynthia wears black for your funeral. Iris just murders you like it's her birthday party. <laughs> That's a great line. I knew she was the champion in uh, Black 2, White 2, and yet, while listening, I still had the the feeling of, wait, this is a League Champions theme? The hell? It's like, oh, oh boy, it's this bright and sparkly and I'm terrified. It's like I'm being beaten in the head over and over by a Barbie doll. <laughs> Oh, Except God. that Barbie doll has that Barbie doll has uh quiver dance three quiver dances up and sweeps your team with bug buzz. I don't know what that means, but it sounds mean. It yeah. means that they have like she boosted her Pokemon three times and now you're dead. <laughs> Ow. Fun times. Musically speaking, the drums in the background and the more bell-like sounds are like a chasm, so the contrast is definitely there. Uh, but some of the sounds used, at least in this video version, uh, listened to like that, are really, really grating to me. And that kind of stops me from vibing to the track, like I try to go, alright, the beat is pretty nice, and suddenly in my right ear with saturation o'clock. 
Yeah, I have actually similar issues with this song. Um, the instrumentation choice is just weird. It's like it's using so, a ton of like 16 bit synth samples in ways that I don't think they're meant to be used. Like I'm hearing like Star Fox or Mega Man X style synths in there, and the harmony section especially. The arrangement is just messing it, with me. It's trying to pretend it's MIDI weird, and not really succeeding. I find it funny that you thing. brought up Mega Man X because the intro made me think of Mega Man Battle Network. So hmm. the thing with this game, well, well first of all, this, this mix that I gave you guys is from Pokelly, who usually does like mastering of it and just making sure that it like like making sure that the instruments are all together so it might just be that specific uh video but at the same time it was a piece that came out as one of the last games on the ds like in general so they were trying to push the hardware to its limit Basically. Yeah, but pushing the hardware to its limit doesn't mean necessarily going with the biggest, most... Basically, doesn't mean you want to destroy your speakers. I think, not to forcefully bring back Castlevania, but this is like the opposite of uh, Harmony of Dissonance, which <laughs> was not using the GBA <laughs> at all and used the GBC sound chips. This is yeah. the extreme opposite, because it, so it still doesn't sound very enjoyable, just because you're using everything. Like, I, I, I mean, the, the, the composition, I, I, I'd say, is probably fine, but yeah. using yeah, like, everything there is, is... There is a mix of this song that is just a banger. I would love to hear that, because like I'm mm -hmm. too distracted by the arrangement in this case. Like It's a very cool yeah, song I, on, I on I paper, would definitely... but... Yeah ask that you show that uh thing yeah to help out i think this is really just for me at least my ears it's an arrangement thing i'm it, it kind of driving the wall thing, yeah yes um but no, then. going from oh. pokemon one of the most well-known rpgs to another one of the most well-known rpgs we're not talking about 14 today but we are talking about 13 Two. Yes. Uh, I would Which also... is the closest thing we'll get, really. Ouch. Um, Look, I'm not bringing it up today. Numerically correct. Uh, numerically correct, I guess. Oh, God, now my head hurts. Anyways. <laughs> um, <laughs> once the again, we're coming back around... 13 minus 2, though, so that should be 11, not 14. How dare you. How dare you? <laughs> Probably better than the actual 11? I'm about to make so many enemies with that statement. No, you. that is a <laughs> enemy maker. I know. Holy wow. I, know. As someone I who, tried that game and I agree. I, I would just note that I, as someone who doesn't play Final Fantasy, I am so glad I have finally managed to make a Final Fantasy joke on this podcast. Alright, so why... So, Lightning, and why is she cute? Uh, it's not Lightning at all. Lightning's barely oh. in this game. There. Um, I do think she's cute. I like the tomboyish look, but no, this this stars her much girlier kid sister Sarah, who probably has no business being a main character and yet nails it. Um, it's kind of because she has no business being a main character that it works so well in this right? story. Um, okay, so let's talk about the game, and I will just say that it is probably the most underrated Final Fantasy game in history. Um, I highly recommend people play 32, especially if they didn't really like 13. Um, yeah. And I would also like to say that this particular song, Run, might be the most underrated song in Final Fantasy history. It's a jazz rock track with just so much going on. It's just, it's a great remix of both Sarah's and Noel's themes. Naoshi Mizuna is really just knocking it out of the park on this one. And just to remind everyone who Naoshi Mizuna is, we are going to bring up 14. He's the guy behind Torn from the Heavens, arguably the main, like, leap motif of the Warrior of Light. Yep. Um. Like, it's such a good combination of everything, and it just cannot seem to escape the shadow of its divisive pre uh, predecessor, despite the whole point of 13-2 going... All right, well, here's a list of everything we got wrong in 13. Let's fix all of it. And they do. Yeah. 
the 13 trilogy feels in its quality and its desire to make back the mistakes of its predecessor oddly and eerily similar to how the Star Wars sequel trilogy went, honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I would argue that The Last Jedi is my favorite, but unlike that, Final Fantasy XIII never got a Rogue One to make that entire trilogy useless anyway. Exactly. Um, I cannot uh, comment on that, song... but that sounds like an insult to Final Fantasy. A little bit. Uh, as far as the song goes, uh, there's a uh, similar to the previous track chasm between that really deep bass and that really high guitar with a bit of controlled dissonance, a controlled chaos, if you will. Oh, yeah. Goes almost panicky at times, and then there's some jazzy piano that reels it in, makes you feel like you're safe, and then goes into it, its own freestyle things, and you were never safe. <laughs> yeah. Also, the, um... the weirdest part is that the, the piano might be the bit I like the least. I, I don't dislike it, but the guitars and the violins are just so good on this song. They're so good. Uh, there's only five instruments. Like, you want to talk arrangement. There's only five instruments on this track. Guitar, drums, piano, violin, and bass guitar. More. That's it. Um, it feels like there's so much more. It does. It almost but... feels like there should be an, an orchestra behind it, but it, it, there isn't. It's it don't very... need no stinking orchestra. It doesn't. It doesn't. Um, Is there orchestral very... versions of this? Not that I'm Probably. aware of. There are versions of these themes played in other tracks that have a lot more going on, like uh, the main violin line is also part of Noel's theme, which takes part of one of the regular battle themes. So, like, it, it, this is, like, a, a culmination song. It's our first, like, full-on battlefield, quote-unquote, dungeon area um, where everything's happening and you're running around and there's no battle music here. It just plays this song the whole time, and it really works. Um... Yeah, um, so while I would argue that the song itself does go with cute and ferocious, I would also argue that the main character, Sarah, uh, also qualifies, because she's definitely a girly girl, and yet, when I heard that she was going to be the star of this thing, I'm like, no heckin' way, but no, she turns out she's just as badass as her sister is, and that's great. Also, her weapon is a Moogle. Her weapon is a Moogle! Uh, it just transforms <laughs> into a bow and a sword as needed. Oh, man. I thought you were going to tell me that she would just grab its ears and just beat people over the head with it. That would be hilarious. I, I mm. still think FF14 will be saved the day we have a monk weapon that is just punching with a Mughal Grapteen in hand. We need that. We need that so bad. How could you put that in my head? I don't even uh, play I mean, Final Fantasy be, 14 be, and I still want that. To be fair, to be fair, we have seen that there are joke weapons that have been placed in from the uh, community arts mm -hmm. competitions. Yeah. But we need this one. Mm -hmm. we, could potent we could potentially get it. What if it happens as one of the Manderville stuff? <laughs> Oh, God. I'm okay with it. <sighs> Galen isn't, but I'm the one talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, fun fact about the song, and this is kind of a personal anecdote. Uh, back in college, we had a lot of different projects, and one of my projects was actually recording a cover of this song where I played piano. My buddy Clayton was supposed to play guitar, but ended up playing bass. Uh, my buddy Kevin played drums. And the person who was supposed to play bass completely blew me off to the point where I basically swore off ever working with her again. Um, Sensible. Yeah. Uh, no. Um, yeah, this song just uh, this song just clicks. And I, I want to talk for a second about the solos because I think this is kind of not talked about enough. A lot of Final Fantasy tracks have solos. Almost none of them have solo chains. Um, but you have the piano solo, then a violin solo, then the drum solo. The only one that doesn't get a solo is the bass guitar. It feels like a genuine jazz song in that yeah. regard. Yeah, which I think really kind of enhances the track in ways that you don't really hear out of this franchise, or really gay music in general. There's an improvisational nature that, uh, doesn't seem present in a lot of other, in a the, lot of uh, other franchises. This sentence 
the only one who didn't get a, a solo was the bass player. Uh, that's the best encapsulation of how rock music tends to be. I mean, I guess that's fair, yes. Everyone gets to shine except the bass player. There's a couple of bands where that's not the case, but sadly this song mm -hmm. does not follow that trend. A motorhead this ain't. Mm -hmm. But it's still a cool song. Very cool song. Oh yeah. Well we're starting off with it. We're we're starting off blast. But you're not talking about a full body drink this time. No, you're talking about an original. Nice. That works. I have a story about this game that I will uh tell once things before we transition, but by all means go all on. Right, then. I'll I'll go as uh, first for my notes. Which is that as I assume most people would look at Blast through the lens of either Windows or just the materials. And by the way, I was correct. UTS I chart. went with I went with Glass as the container. The glass is clinking with a couple of friends at the bar just sitting. And also Sprachbrooks is a very good representation of that mood. The piano having a lot of double notes, even the drums going doom doom help with both a jazzy feeling, but also evoking the image of <laughs> clinking glasses together. I didn't expect that sound. Neither did I. Nice, <laughs> but also... So it's funny, I actually have a slightly different interpretation of what you went for with glass, which is kind of funny. Uh, but we Go will actually... Ahead. No, no, we will talk about that when I get to my pick. Um, I actually yeah. made a request for the production order on this one. Because three of the songs had a similar quality to them um, that I'm going to describe more in detail during my own pick. I just, um, I don't have too much to say on this song besides saying that it's a very pleasant, loungy song. But it is. Uh, I do want to quote a specific sentence I wrote down on my notes, which is, I love the piano, but you already knew that. <laughs> what else if, is new? If you've been listening to us for long enough, you, you already expected that. Yeah, and like, as a heads up, uh, it's going to be a lot of piano for this category. Turns out glass and piano works well together. Glass harmonicas in shambles. So, poor glass harmonica. Underused. I have a story about Catherine. And <laughs> why I've never means. played the game. I am personally okay. insulted by its existence for reasons completely unrelated to the content of the game itself. Why? Continue. I almost worked on it. Ooh. Oh. oh. I say almost because this gets ugly quick. So I, ah. uh, I put myself in as a bid to record the dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. And this is when I was mm -hmm. first starting out my career, and I'm like, I'm totally going to get into game audio. Um, and I actually got a deal memo. And I was actually about to sign on the dotted line. Cue my agent, who shall remain nameless, going behind my back to try to change the terms of the deal and get me, and by extension them, more pay. Oh. Atlas then spiked the deal, therefore I was no longer working on this project. This oh. all happened that... behind my back and resulted in one very fired agent. Mm-hmm. And yeah, also, no rightfully so. Yeah. And me being that too is... damn salty to ever play this game because I'm constantly reminded of what could have been. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, because that's completely that... fair. And that would have been a pretty sick project. Uh huh. That yeah. would have, like, could have changed the trajectory of where you are here now. You could have been the face of a disembodied voice saying Edge a lot. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I'm not really sure how to take that, but sure. Um. So yeah, um, I I just get irrationally angry. Even how long no, has it been? I, Ten, twelve years later? I disagree. I think you're getting very rationally angry. I think you're getting really very rationally angry too. I, I agree with Ran on this one. I would be angry too. <laughs> so yeah, unfortunately, I've never played this one, despite being a game that I otherwise am all about. Yeah, like it's an SMT weird offshoot about relationship. And it's a puzzle game as far as the gameplay goes. Yeah. What's not to like? It's very wacky, and it's my kind of wacky, and I totally, like, in a vacuum would want to play this, and nope. 
because you have history and yeah, I know that. I have, I, I still have that original deal, choice. Bebo. I kept it. I still have the, the dead tree it's on. It's in a drawer in my, in my bedroom right now. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's very understandable. Yep. A, a very logical reason to go, nope, I'm out. Yep. Through this. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I'm going to even need a transition to go into <laughs> the next track, The City of Tears. Hollow Knight is one, nope, I'm out for me. Uh, why? It's it's hard uh, as balls. <laughs> <sighs> um, anyway, there, let's continue. On. Um, yes. so city. So first of all, small little like I'll do my little written stuff, and then I'll do a small little story. Uh, <laughs> city of Tears represents glass to me as. A reflection of past. A ringing voice calling out to the other side of a suffering that will never end for the bugs of Hollow Knight. The strings of the harp pattering against the glass of windows as rain falls upon a city that hopes to see a new day but struggles against the encroaching corruption of the world around them. The cello starts up in the middle, reflecting the call of the woman singing out her song letting the world resound in a beautiful but echoing reminder that this is only a dark reflection of what it once was. Very poetic. Yeah, the late the... piano and choir really help convey the fragility of this place in many regards. It yeah, is the, the piano such, kinda... a po to me... such a poetic game. Yeah, to, to me, the, the piano kind of plays two vibes. Uh, in one sense, it's kind of feels like the proverbial tears in the name. It's like drops of water falling down with those very and high notes. the place is full of waterfalls. Uh, heads up. Mm -hmm. yeah, at so the same time, down. it also gives a sense of fragility. Uh, to me, high piano notes always tend to sound like something fragile, uh, which glass fits perfectly there. So, so if uh, those piano notes, they're, they're really, really pretty really uh, lovely to listen to. Yeah. I... Hollow Knight is such a great soundtrack when it comes to its poetry of the narrative that you don't even need to play the game in order to understand mm -hmm. what's going on just by listening to the music. I have seen a few uh, two-hour-long video essays on the lore, so yeah, I agree with that take. I will once again reserve my comment for my pick because it's the same comment I mean, as the first song. Believe it or I not, I don't need. I don't need to have a comments because I'm getting you to play it in <laughs> December. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, I, think... I made a deal. Yeah. Uh, uh... Made a deal with the dev- I mean, the Galen. You uh, didn't make a deal with me, you gotta still win the vote. I, I do just want to make a comment. Uh, it does, in advance, also apply to the next song, but it's particularly strong in this one for me. Uh, I get the vibe that the, the music kind of represents the idea of glass, both in the sense of uh, it, it being fragile, uh, that if something particularly solid hits it, it easily shatters. Mm -hmm. But it also represents a sense of resiliency that glass also has, in that if left untouched, glass can just stay around for ages. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it brings to mind the idea of uh, stained glass in particular for that, which is something that the next uh, song also does to me, but not quite the same level. Uh, well, honestly, listening listening to them in order feels right. <laughs> uh, well, tempered glass is actually very, very hard. Like you know how in movies someone gets hit with a glass bottle, and the bottle shatters. Yeah, it basically never happens in real life. I've hit someone with a bottle and it just went kerthunk. Mm-hmm. You are full of stories Those are today. Just I am full I'm of stories today. With context for that. <laughs> I'm not going to give context for that. 
Good. Oh, uh, uh, Gail and not here. <laughs> because we, I do not want to handle the legal liability of it all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to shout out Gail and out here just casually going, oh, I, I hit someone with a bottle just when could think, well, that was a regular Tuesday. Hey, look, <laughs> what use is a podcast if not to casually drop? Oh, yeah, by the way, committed assault. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to absolve you of all legal liability. I've already been punished for this event. We're, it's Thank already you. done. Double jeopardy is a thing in this country. <laughs> Perfect. Um, anyways, <laughs> I was actually looking for a different remix than the one I picked. I was looking for the Blake Robinson remix of Memories of Green from Chrono Trigger. I got the Malcolm Robinson remix. How did two oh. different arrangers with the same last name of Robinson turn into two really good Chrono Trigger orchestration albums? Anyway, uh, Blake Robinson is the composer of The Stanley Parable and Portal Lights. Oh. Um, a British composer who is quite talented and has also done a couple of remix albums, one for Chrono Trigger, one for Super Metroid, and a bunch of our other original work. And then I have no idea who Malcolm Robinson is, but Joe Shola, otherwise known as I'm a Filthy Casual in my Twitch, um, likes the Robins likes the Malcolm Robinson ones, which is what this one is. Blake doesn't release all of his stuff on YouTube, which I think is why this happened. So while there are elements of the Blake Robinson soundtrack on there, this this track wasn't one of them. But they both have one thing in common, and that's the piano mixing. And we're going to talk about reverb right now. Because it's kind of hilarious. There's certain levels of reverb. At its least reverby, we call that dry. At its most, we call it cathedral. You know what we call it in the middle? Glassy. Is it glass? It's glassy. <laughs> you know what these last three songs all have in common? All Is it a glassy, glassy reverb? reverb? It's glassy reverb on the piano in particular. Somehow. <laughs> Are we good or what? Right? I'm like. How did we do this? Three of us, three of us in a row, Gaston, glassy piano mixing without any interaction with each other on this. It makes my engineer heart go a flutter. <laughs> Today I learned I like glassy piano. Right? Today I learned I like glassy piano. Right? Um, and somehow, Eddie, you of all people are the only one that don't have this. I'm, I'm baffled by this turn of events. I, I um, mean, my, my pick was that in stone from the start. Around, we'll get there. Yeah. Anyway, Sam, welcome to the permanent crew. Uh, Eddie, I hope you enjoy a uh, guest spot every now and then. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Oh, Lord. <laughs> but please don't tell but, yeah. me I bought this mic stand for nothing. Uh, um, no. Uh, so this song, like, I, I don't know what else to talk about Memories of Green as a song. Yasuda Urbitsuda's magnum opus may as well be Chrono Trigger. Like, for all of his incredible work, and he's done a lot of incredible work over the years, I don't think anything stands the test of time more than this track. Or, sorry, <laughs> more than this soundtrack. Time, um, But yeah, no, I, I picked this one because this is the glassiest piano I could think of off the top of my head. And then you guys did the same, and I'm like, I'm going to stick with this, and we're going to tell some engineering knowledge. That's literally my only comment about it. That's literally the whole reason it's on here. I mean, so if there isn't add... any better reason. Well, I'm also going to add that this reprise of the main theme in this ethereal way make it so feel like it's distant, fragile, like you're looking through a glass, or like it's a dream of some of some sort, but it's a bit of a dreamy version of a theme. Ha. Uh, so, yeah. Talking about Double Joe Party, that uh, track qualifies in itself as well. Yeah, this wouldn't have been a bad pick for Dreamy, honestly, but I, again, the mixer in me is like, well, glassy piano, let's yeah, got a no. lot of glassy piano. This song, let's hit the stamp on it, let's go. Hey, look, if I could get away with Deep Purple, you can get away with glassy piano reverb. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, it's, not, it's not like the, I mean, the song itself doesn't fit the theme, even ignoring that, because it gives me very similar vibes to City of Tears. Yeah, well, for speaking obvious, of, yeah. Speaking of glass, I'm surprised you didn't choose something from Vault of Glass, Eddie. Oh boy. I was wondering if we were going to bring that up, so, uh, for the 
uninitiated, uh, Bot of Glass is a, a raid in Destiny. Uh, I think it was originally Destiny 1, and now it's been ported to Destiny 2 as well. Anyway, uh, of course, I would end up eventually bringing up a song from Destiny to the podcast. Uh, and uh, I have Deep Stone Lullaby, which uh, th there's a bit of a story for this one. Uh, this is probably one of the most iconic pieces in the entire Destiny franchise from Destiny 1 all the way up to the current expansion of Destiny 2. Um, you can find videos online on the moment I fell in love with Deep Stone Crypt, which is the raid where, where this song plays. And every single time those videos are about the moment where this song kicks in and th there's a bit of an explanation that I need to go into uh, here uh, the actual raid uh, you start on the grounds of Europa the moon of uh, Jupiter but uh, soon after uh, the first encounter I think you grab some shuttles which I think are meant to be a sort of space elevator and move up to a space station on the orbit of your room. And the first thing you do after beating the first boss is go into a spacewalk. And during that spacewalk, a few things happen. First, this song kicks in. Two, the sound effects are extremely muffled because sound doesn't travel through space. But since this is a video game, they can't completely get rid of sounds because you need sound cues to know where enemies are so they mm -hmm. muffle the sounds a lot so the song really comes forward and yeah the dead space method yeah, mm -hmm. yeah pretty much and I believe it was one of the first few times where you actually got to do a spacewalk in Destiny uh, despite being a very sci-fi game you don't usually do spacewalks uh, and be <laughs> Beyond all of that, uh, which already you, you might be seeing the, the threads of, you know, being fragile, open in space, and I've mentioned multiple times that I associate glass with fragility. Mm -hmm. There's a lore element here as well, because the place where the raid happens is a place where uh, a mad scientist, for the lack of a better term, came up with what the lore calls uh, exoframes, which are like robotic bodies where um, they transfer human consciousness from a human body to these exoframes to live forever, essentially. Uh, at least that's the plan. So it kind of also plays into the idea of the fragility of the human body uh, in that sense, uh, from the lore perspective. And again, it also uh, kind of speaks to the, uh, the idea of living forever, so to speak, because these exoframes are meant to live forever. And there's another layer on that, because this specific song was composed as being the last thing you hear as you are going into sleep so that your brain uh, processes can be extracted from your body to the exoframe, killing your human body but leaving you immortal in the exoframe. But the process wipes your memories out. So there's also the fragility of the memories there. The lore huh, is so many very layers. Dark. So many layers. It's like some sort of glass. Uh, mm, what's a thing with layers that could be of glass? Mm, not garlic, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glass onion was nah, a good this movie. This will come to me later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anything to that? Uh, I do have, in more serious note, to say that I really like the use of the soul organ instead mm -hmm. of a string or clearly electronic seams to provide texture at the start. Honestly, it's pretty neat. I guess my own thing is, without that context that Eddie provided, my brain was like, this sounds more dreamy than glassy, but with the context, I totally get it. Mm -hmm. 
it, yeah, with the association, mm-hmm. with, uh, it's definitely all sorts of fragility. Uh, as with uh, all the YouTubers online, it's also the the thing that made me fall in love with this raid. It, it is a, a mm-hmm. beautiful moment when you reach into the space and look into open space, and you listen to that uh, that soft, honestly beautiful piano kick in. It's it's a great moment, and the, the idea of. Uh, fragility and being brittle but at the same time eternal and potentially very strong i i like this this duality of glass and it being represented by the duality of the humans in this in this setting i mean glass is fragile because it's so unyielding it's because it doesn't bend that it breaks Mm Shut your white tub, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I don't have a response to that. I'm not sure what I could respond with. Then let's go on and, uh, given that we've expressed our more honest thoughts on uh, these little mini films, uh, we can move on to some no playing that somehow hadn't already started. Despite the destiny peak. <laughs> Music arcade now playing. Surprise, I'm playing Destiny 2. Who would have thought? We just talked about it. <laughs> yes. yes. Surprise. Uh, yeah, I just I wanna uh, take the opportunity to just address something real quick that isn't related to music, but the timing of our two previous episodes didn't help. Mm-hmm. Uh as of two episodes ago, uh, sadly, Lance Reddick passed away. Mm-hmm. The man yeah. was a huge person in the Destiny community. Thousands of people held vigils next to his NPC in the main social space for mm-hmm. hours on end. To the point his family uh, posted a tweet recognizing that. Um, so I just want to say my piece because uh, the timing was kind of poor for yeah. t- talking about it pr- uh, previously. Uh, so I I wanna just say something about it, and he will sorely be missed. His uh, performance as Commander Zavala was very iconic and very warm. He really felt like a friend who got your back, and uh, it will be it has been actually kind of tough uh, to continue with the game without him, especially yeah. since recently a character died and Commander Zavala appears to do a eulogy. As if it's a funeral. Yeah. And that's gotta be that tough in retrospect. So yeah. Uh, that... uh, as, wow. as many other Destiny players have said before, uh, see you star side commander, may you rest in peace, uh, Lance Reddick. Um, I would also like to shout out Lance's performance in um, the Horizon series as Silence. Um, another game that he... He was just surrounded by like full-time voice actors and that's not usually something that um you know a hollywood guy like him a screen guy like him really does but he really knocked out of the park and he's such an iconic part of that franchise as well not having him around for that is going to be just heartbreaking i mean not to talk about something other than video games but if anybody follows legend of vox machina from like critical role like he was playing they're big bad for this current arc. Mm-hmm. Thordak, who is supposed to appear and be a big part of season three. So, and he was amazing. Yeah. He's an actor's actor. Uh, I've, mm-hmm. I've mostly paid attention to him on just on you know television primarily the wire and fringe and bosch and even Wait. netflix's resident evil show at a terrible uh josh holloway like techno thriller called intelligence that he was in and really good at it he just always shows up and always turns into great performance he's just one of these and actors who john wick yeah and john wick he's one of these actors but who just got, like his performance is uh-huh. there in four uh-huh so... It was yeah, so think... sudden and so awful, and I, he is going to be missed. He is, he, this, out of the recent slate of, like, celebrity deaths, he is by far the one that affects me the most. 
and I think mm-hmm. it, it's fair to say that uh, between uh, the Resident Evil show, between Destiny, between Horizon, even the uh, audio drama slash podcast series Batman Unburied, where he plays Thomas Wayne, I think it's fair to say the man became an icon of, mm-hmm. so to speak, nerd culture. And it, it, it's a great it's- loss. Uh, I would just feel wrong not addressing it in the podcast. I yeah. completely agree. But uh, m- moving, moving along to something more, more positive, to not end in a, in a low note. Yes. Uh, things I've been playing, uh, I've kind of uh, took a little bit of a break from Marvel's Midnight Suns because I discovered that I am at the final story mission and the final DLC hasn't dropped yet. And I know I'm the kind of guy who, once he finishes the story, he doesn't come back to a game. Mm-hmm. So I'm taking a break because I do want to experience the DLC after all, I paid for that crap. Um, Fair. And <laughs> since I'm taking a break on that front, the game that's been taking its place when I need something more, uh, let's say, something that I don't need to focus as much low uh, impact on, on action. Uh, I've been playing Army of Ruin, which I believe Galen brought up in a previous episode as well, and it's it's a solid indie game uh, yeah. with uh, vampire survivors like trappings. Yep, uh, it's a vampire survivors clone out and out. Like it doesn't reinvent the wheel, but damn, the soundtrack's better than it has any right to be. Oh yeah, uh, they finally uh, put uh, online some of the soundtrack. Uh, met- we've managed to track four. Yeah, the songs. Uh, the game has. Five songs right now, one for menus and then one for each of the four stages. The fourth isn't uh, the soundtrack to the fourth stage isn't up online, as far as I could tell. Mm-hmm. And not to put any pressure on the dev team or anything, but uh, each new stage has a better song than the previous one to me. So here's hoping the fifth stage is even better. But uh, that that's it from uh, for for my end. Well, on my end, uh, I don't play much new besides, of course, Yakuza 3. Uh, but I did sleep in a whole time discovering the new uh, and latest uh, DLC for uh, Fire Emblem Engage, a game with a terrible story but a great soundtrack. And uh, uh, the final Xenologue, unlike the three previous sets of DLC, is not just uh, reusing existing track, but having its new uh, an additional set of songs as part of a whole mini campaign in this kind of mirror universe. As a person who has played Fire Emblem Heroes, hearing Xenolog gives me cringe flashbacks. Well, cringing is the proper reaction for most things Fire Emblem engage, honestly. Uh, but uh, yeah, the track in question, Salvation of and Loss, which is the main uh, map theme for uh, the early fights at the very least. I haven't finished the mini campaign or anything, uh, but uh, it's it really reflects this whole mirror universe feel with its reverse instruments and all that. So still acing it in that regard. Next. Um, okay, so like you, the only new game I've played is is uh, Yakuza 3, a game that I will admit early that I am not enjoying very much. Um, that said, uh, I have gotten back into, more or less by accident, a zombie survival game called Seven Days to Die, which my old friend Chad is like, hey, you want to play this with me? I'm like, sure, I haven't played multiplayer with people in a while, let's do it. Uh, and it's been a fun time. The soundtrack is there. It's there. It's fine. <laughs> it's not bad. It's not good, but it's not bad. At least it doesn't distract you from surviving. Yep. But I thought the goal was to die in in under seven days. <laughs> oh it is a weirdly uh, titled game. It is. Uh, so the reason for that is there's a blood moon every seven days, unless you change that in the stats, which you could do. I know someone who's, I, I know one friend of mine did it every three. Um, but there's a blood moon every seven days, which just summons just horde after horde after horde. 
Um, and just to tell you how my game of this went, uh, the first Blood Moon, me and Chad had absolutely no problems. We didn't have a problem with that horde at all. And then immediately I got a random fight with one dog, get infected, and have to take an intentional death to clear that. Hmm. Like, sounds gee, right. thanks, game. Appreciate it. Yeah, it sounds about right <laughs> for a right. survival game. Mm-hmm. And that's it for me. Alright. So, finishing off stuff, uh, my... I have been getting told by my friends uh, for a bit to play a visual novel game called Heavenly Mine. And it is... Philosophical, sapphic, and absolutely wonderful. And I am. It, it is such. The, the soundtrack just evokes such good. Like, feelings for. It, it, it is a game with sci fi, philosophical shenanigans. And the soundtrack does it so much justice. And I really enjoy it. And before you say it, yes, the anime person talking about a visual novel. It's kind of on the nose. I get it. <laughs> hey, you stole my joke. It's called... You didn't say it during the podcast, so therefore I get to use it free reign. Next time I'm trademarking <sighs> it. <laughs> uh, and with that, that is all the time we have for this episode. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Big thanks to Sam for joining us again to follow up this episode, to follow up the mm. April Fool's episode. We will be thanks back. Thanks for having me. If, uh, can I get my brain in order? If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or ideas, you can send them to music.arcade.podcast.gmail.com or any of our links down below. Thank you, guys. And, uh, have a happy Easter, y'all. We're free! We're free! Happy Pesach! See you next time.